And here we go. Yeah, here we go. Thank you, Sactus. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining tonight. Uh, thank you, Sactis, for organizing the session. I also thank Microsoft for hosting the, the talk tonight. And uh, I'm quite excited today because I get to talk about my three favorite topics uh, at the same time. So big data, in-memory analytics, and cloud computing. And uh, to do that, we will tell the story of an experiment that we at ActiveYAM did with Microsoft. We wanted to explore new possibilities for in-memory computing <coughs> in the cloud. And yes, we ended up creating some systems that can operate 4,000 cores and 60 terabytes of memory. And that you can start from nothing to usable in less than half an hour. So we'll tell you everything about it, all the steps to do it yourself if you want. And I think that as we go, it will send a a strong message. The message is that you can add up the advantages of in-memory computing and of the cloud. So fast analytics, interactive analytics of in-memory in computing together with the agility and the cost efficiency of the cloud. And this combination, I think, is the foundation of uh, something new, like a new model to build a new generation of operational applications. So I'm, in, I'm Antoine, I'm the head of R&D at ActiveVM. And with my R&D teams in New York and Paris, we build the ActiveVM analytical platform. And uh, it's a very powerful platform that uh, can help uh, make faster and better decisions to, to keep it short. And uh, I came today with uh, Nida Bouzid, my colleague, and the technology manager of the Activium office in Singapore. And uh, Nida and I joined Activium uh, at the beginning, 10 years ago. It was in Paris, and uh, we wrote the first lines of code of the product together. We did the first client implementations together. But then, seven years ago now, he left Paris for Asia, and he established the technical team of Activium in uh, APAC. And he's been lead leading it since, since that time. So we thought that to do the presentation tonight, we would do it in two parts. Why and how? Why did we do that? And how to do it? What? Sorry? In between, we have to have pizza. That's yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you, why do we do this? Have pizza? And how to do it? And uh, the why section, I'll just spend a few minutes to go back to in-memory technology as a trend, and the change it brings, and the new use cases that benefit from it. But then we, we will quickly jump into the heart of the presentation, which is the step-by-step -step tutorial to do it at full speed and to operate thousands of cores and tens of terabytes of memory, and uh, all that with the agility of the cloud. Let's get started. So, how important is this in-memory computing story? After all, the idea of uh, loading data in memory to, to process it is as old as computer science. But, yes, but it used to be one little chunk of data at a time, right? Uh, between the 80s and today, you may know that the price of memory has been divided by a million. It's a million times cheaper to use a RAM today than it was in the 80s. So of course, at that time, uh, nobody could dream of loading an entire data set into memory. We, no, we could dream. You, <laughs> it's, it's all you could do. You could dream of it, but now everyone can do it. And it's not even a, an investment anymore because you can get uh, with a finger snap an instance in the public cloud in Azure that, that gets uh, as much as two terabytes of memory in one instance. That's the current max. So no planning. You can get them on the fly. And so when you think about that, uh, two terabytes of memory, I think it's probably enough to handle 90% of all the data sets in the world. But not web indexing, 
not Facebook, but for the rest of us, 90% of the data set in the world, they would fit into terabytes of memory. And so, there is no wonder that all the technologies that we've used, that we know and we've used before, they are now being redone with in-memory computing. i put a few examples on, uh, on this slide. For instance, when it comes to OLTP, so very fast uh, small transactions, VoltDB was one of the first to introduce in-memory technology to accelerate and improve OLTP workloads. And I'm sure you've heard about SAP HANA, which, is, uh, which does it for analytical queries. And also uh, other technologies such as uh, key value stores, Redis, for instance, but also Coherence or Hazardcast. They also use in-memory computing to give you low latency access to data elements. And, uh, and finally, let's not forget Spark, Apache Spark, uh, the very famous batch processing framework that uh, accelerates batch processing in, on big data by keeping intermediary results in memory. So everything you could do before, you, could do it, you can do it faster now with in-memory computing. But is this the end of it, doing the same than before faster? I don't think so. I think there is another way to, to look at it. And I put up just a few examples from uh, my experience of what actually uh, are the benefits of in-memory computing in real-life use cases. So all businesses, little and big, they have their, um, their rules, their um, formulas to quantify how well they run, to quantify their opportunities or their risks. But very often, those calculations, they are run uh, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, before the board meeting maybe, and in an Excel spreadsheet. It's very common. But what will happen when those organizations realize that those uh, calculations they use to steer the business, now they could do them all the time, continuously on real life data. So that's what in-memory computing brings. It's not about accelerating a practice that already existed. It's about changing the way you're doing things to introduce uh, um, real-time notifications, to do calculations on the fly, what-if analysis, alerts, right? And for instance, let's start with the, our examples. Banks, banking industry is a big uh, user of in-memory computing. And for instance, traders with in-memory computing, they can have a, a more precise and more real-time calculation of the risk. And for them, it means that they can operate closer to the limit. They can take a, few, a bit more risk and for better margins, of course. But beyond that also, uh, with the new ability to, to test decisions directly on the live data, what-if analysis, uh, when they are about to do a trading decision, they can test several options and see in instantly the feedback, the, the outcome of those decisions, and take the best. And it's not just for traders. Um, risk controllers also uh, in banks who are uh, reviewing and monitoring the risk indicators of the bank. They can also do their job faster and with less mistakes because with in-memory computing, they can calculate uh, they can run the calculation on the fly as many times as they want. They can look at the steps of the calculation. They can go to the level of detail that they want. And that's how they can improve their productivity. And uh, if we look at, uh, at retail or e-commerce website, you know, there are marketing teams there uh, in charge of setting product prices. They set the right price for the products to to be sold. And for that, they use some business rules and formulas to determine the right price. So it involves maybe the stock level, the price of the competitors, of course, very important input, uh, the time of the day, the time of the year, and uh, web analytics activity, maybe. All of that goes into a big formula that gives you the right price. And of course, with in-memory computing, every time any of those parameters changes, 
They can rerun the pricing algorithm again and again, continuously, and that's how they enter into the dynamic pricing era. This uh, new field that was uh, uh, pioneered by Amazon, Amazon.com, of course, but that is now spreading to all organizations, e-commerce, online, but also retailers and brick and mortar. And let's look at one last example in the field of supply chain. Here, for instance, the food retailers use uh, special tools to plan in advance the delivery routes from the warehouses to the stores. So it's planned in advance. But within memory computing, they get the new ability to do fast and uh, informed changes to those plans. And uh, for instance, I will tell you a story that a friend working in a, in a big uh, um, in a big food retailer in the U.S. told me, he told me that um, when there is a, when the weather forecast uh, announces a sudden cold, I don't know in, in, in Northern California, for instance, uh, statistically it is known that when the cold comes, people will drink more cocoa, more hot cocoa, and so there is an opportunity to put more cocoa on the shelves of the stores in that region. But the question when you're uh, uh, operating the business is how do you do it? Will you uh, reroute uh, some uh, trucks that were going somewhere else? Or will you shift stock from another store in the same country? And of course, it's much easier to know the answer, to know the best decision when you can calculate the outcome of each of them. And I, I could give you many more examples uh, of uh, how in memory computing can change the way you're doing things in uh, different businesses, because I, I draw them from uh, what our customers are doing with the Activian technology. But if you, if you think about those, just those three examples right now, you, you see that they have something in common. They have all operated a transition from batch processing to intraday applications, from static reports, pre-canned reports, to interactive analysis, and from spreadsheets to collaborative environments where different uh, people who run the business can collaborate. And enabling this transition, this is really what we do. In fact, it's the best introduction to Activia. We are the technology to do that, to do this transition. And uh, Activia itself, uh, the analytical stack of Activia, is a comprehensive and, and powerful suit. So the primary component at the top is called Active Payload. Maybe you've heard about this before. And uh, it's an in-memory analytical database. And that, uh, that is very unique in the sense that it, uh, it fusions uh, database technology, database engineering, to do filter, uh, group by, aggregates, together with a true calculation engine, something that is more like HPC. And that's very, a very key ingredient to in-memory computing, I believe, because if you remember to the three use cases we just looked at, it's not BI, it's more than BI. There are actual calculations, there are SLAs for supply chain, there were risk indicators in finance, there were uh, price formulas for dynamic pricing. So all of that is more than BI and requires an actual calculation engine uh, mixed and combined with the database technology. So that's what Activian is. And over those 10 years when we've been working hard on this, so we have become one of the leaders of in-memory computing, in particular in finance. We are the industry leader for in-memory computing in finance. And uh, being recognized as such has opened up for us key technology partnerships. For instance, uh, we are working with Oracle and the guys at Oracle who make Java because ActivePivot is based on the Java platform. And so we have access to the guy who makes the JVM at Oracle. And for instance, Java 9, <coughs> releasing this fall, contains major improvements that we ask them to do and that make it easier to run ActivePivot and in-memory computing on the JVM. And also, that's what opened up for us uh, key partnerships with the big cloud computing players, in particular Microsoft Azure. 
And with them, what we're trying to do is to bring in memory computing to everyone. We're trying to lower the bar to enter this technology, to use it on uh, your own use cases. Because uh, we believe that uh, by combining the strengths of cloud computing with the strengths of in-memory, we will create something new. If you're here tonight, uh, I guess that you already know the advantages of cloud computing. Right? So to me, the most important one are the agility and the elasticity. The agility of how you can get resources. You can get a server with two terabytes of memory uh, in a few seconds. While before, maybe it would have, been, would have taken months in an organization to get this server. And the agility of the application that you run, that because you can start them on demand, run them on the hardware for the time it's being used, and shut them down. And of course, the elasticity of the platform where you can, uh, uh, if your instance is too small, you, overnight you could replace it by a bigger instance or the elasticity that's even more real time, which is uh, managing a cluster where you, you can add nodes or remove nodes uh, during the day to match peak capacity and to stay efficient uh, regarding costs. Right. So we all know the benefits of the cloud, but maybe for others uh, who haven't been playing with cloud computing so much, all of this is still abstract. Those are just words. And what we really wanted to do was to demonstrate this stuff, to demonstrate this combination on real stuff, on a real project. And so did Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, because they have a long-term investment in uh, high-performance computing in the cloud. That's why they partnered with us. And that's why they opened up access to their expertise and their resources. And here is what we did with them. We, we took um, a big data use case, backtesting and trade analysis in finance on a historical data set. So we, we took a, a 400 days historical data set, 100 gigabytes per day, for a total of 40 terabytes of data. So with 40 terabytes of data, which is big data territory, uh, if you want to do better than just a batch, batch processing on the 40 terabytes, you need in-memory, period. There is no way you can do things interactively on 40 terabytes without <coughs> in-memory computing. But at the same time, uh, buying and operating enough servers to process 40 terabytes in memory is very expensive. It can be a showstopper for most organizations. And uh, instead, what we should be able to do is to rent it. Let's not buy those servers. Let's rent them just for the time needed to do the analysis, to do the analysis session. And of course, uh, at this scale, it sounds impossible. It was impossible to use 40 terabytes and, uh, and uh, thousands of cores just for an hour until it's done. Sounds like too much work. But of course, big spoiler, in fact, it's possible. It's possible today. And uh, we did it. We did it in Azure. You can do it in Azure too. And uh, to, to do this, to load the 40 terabyte data set in memory and be able to do interactive queries over it, it took us a cluster of 128 servers, some of the biggest servers available in Azure. So those instances called G5. You know the G5 instances? Yeah, they come with 500 gigabytes of RAM and about 32 cores, I guess. So overall, this system uh, has more than 4,000 cores and 60 terabytes of RAM. And you will see that uh, in Asia it's possible to start this cluster from nothing at all, just the data stored on cloud storage at rest, and do everything, start everything on the fly until it's ready for analysis in less than half an hour. 
<laughs> I don't know, is there anyone from Microsoft in the room? <laughs> uh, it could be improved, yeah, but that's setting the record, so maybe next year. <laughs> so we will now enter the heart of the presentation. Uh, we'll do the step-by-step -step presentation and explain how it can be done. And for that, uh, I will be handing, uh, handing over to Nida, who will start with step one. How do you start that many instances on the fly? You want the best, right? <laughs> yeah. No, not really. I give you the price of the cluster, uh, the price per hour of the cluster at the end. Yeah. So Nida, handing over to you, and he will, Nida will show you that you can start 128 instances in the cloud with just one line of code. Yeah. Thank you, Antoine. Indeed, indeed, this um, 128 instances were started with just one line of code, but as you will see, this line of code takes like three slides. <laughs> So as you can see here, like we use it, um, um, Java um, SDK to start uh, those uh, 128 instances. We started first by defining the network interface, and then we defined the virtual machines. We started by using, we built our own uh, virtual machine based on Linux, of course, where we installed our software, Active Pivot, and this is how we deployed the one, uh, 128 instances, based, as you can see, on the standard G5 um, Azure instance. So the last part is just to validate that everything is up. So this is, um, this is how we started all our instances. Of course, Active Pivot when, when you start every instance, the VM turn, turns on, and then the active pivot um, in memory database will be turned on as well and start pumping the data from the blob storage. Let's talk a bit about what is a blob storage. The blob storage is where this is the solution offered by Microsoft Azure to store your data. This is what you attach to your VM instance. And it's made with what we call an account. This is the main entry point to the blob storage. Every account can manage a limited number of containers, and every container can manage a limited number of blobs. The blob, this is where this is your file, basically. It could be any type of file. And the container, it's just if you need to group the files by type, I don't know, like videos, music, CSV data, XML, etc. So this is what we used to load our, um, our data. So first challenge. First challenge is to start sourcing the data as fast as we can. If you recall where, well, we had to load 40 terabyte of data. If we have only one instance that has to load those 40 terabyte, the bandwidth we were having, on the instance side is 50 megabyte. So we would load everything in nine days. So that was not acceptable, of course. But of course, you can do it with this code. This is the basic naive code that you will find when you go and visit um, the Azure website, asking, like, how can I use Java to download data from the blob storage? So this is the naive and the naive approach. If you have to load, of course, few meg of data, but you have to be smarter than that if you want to be, if you want to load 40 terabytes in 30 minutes, to make them available in 30 minutes. So then, we move it to the old recipes. Actually, the, the single instance will, um, will connect to the blob storage through HTTP. So then we decided to, instead of having one single connection, <clears throat> is to saturate the bandwidth of the VM instance and to open as many HTTP connections as we can. This is what some download software, legal or illegal stuff, use. So this is what we, what, what we did. 
Okay, so we, we were saturating the bandwidth of the instance, and then we're having um, 20 plus uh, connections per instance. Just to give you an idea about the snippet of code we used, the download method you see here is um, what every task will use to start downloading the data from the blob storage. If you're familiar with the Java API, I can tell you that we relied on the out-of-the-box um, Java, uh, uh, Java NIO channel uh, package. And we relied here, as you can see, what I highlighted, the download range to byte array, which downloads the data from the blob storage and writes this in the, uh, in the byte buffer. And then you can work on it. Sorry, I just have a question. I have not read it. This is like back to the beginning, the third line from the top. This will consider the case where uh, the, the data is geographically located in the cluster. Actually, the, the storage that we are using, what, 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 what's the exact question? Is like if the storage is in another is an, another uh, geography, like uh, my, my instance is in Singapore and, uh, and my storage is in uh, the US? Is it what you mean? No. Uh, you're, you're trying to say select star from something. And uh, uh, the something, the data is uh, replicated. So is it taking that consideration? Uh, yes, <coughs> but it is transparent. Uh, yeah. when, when, when you call... Uh, Blob storage to get a block of data. Like this is problem. Automatically, it will probably take the, the replica the closest to the VM. Yeah. And of course, to, to make it faster, you have to take the closest one. It is not explicit. You don't decide which replica you get it from. It's transparent, uh, like a service. So the overall connector that we wrote is like has. Of course, of course, much more lines than what you see, but this is the, the, the main core logic that we implemented. Okay, so keep that in mind. You have to open many connections, many HTTP connections, saturate the, the, your network interface on the um, instance side, and then start pumping the data in parallel. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't mention. So if you recall well, if I go to the first slide we said like theoretically we will load four, 40 terabyte in more than nine days with one single connection when we parallelize the work we'll load that in nine hours of course if we rely on one storage account and on one instance but as you can see this is we use it more instances and more storage accounts so from nine days we move it to nine hours and now what we noticed as well is every storage account has also a throughput of 30 gigabit per second. So to saturate the storage as well, we need more than one instance. Remember, one instance 10, three instances 30. So this is how we will saturate every storage. And then from nine hours, you move to three hours with three instances, loading the data in parallel from the storage account. And then the final um, metrics we ended with. So we were loading the 40 terabyte in 13 minutes. We relied on 128 instances. So roughly you have 40, um, 40 accounts that were used. Um, and then 40 times uh, three instances, you have the 128. What you have to keep in mind is we had an aggregated bandwidth of 50 gigabyte per second. So this allowed us to load the 40 terabytes in almost 13 minutes. Of course, here I'm talking about the 13 minutes, but you have more than 30 minutes because you have, um, Antoine will describe that later on, our dis later on, our distributed technology, like the nodes have to, you, you have to have some exchange of data between the nodes and so on. So this to have the cluster up and running, you need more than that. But this is just the loading part. I know you like this one. So th this is uh, the, um, okay, let me introduce 
this, this graph you're looking at. So on the x-axis you see the time, and on the y-axis you see the data. And one single color here is the instance getting bigger and bigger loading the data. Looks like a swarm, so a nice, uh, ni looks like nice painting. But you can see here that we were really loading as fast as we can, and I guess the, the, the neighbors who were living around us on the cloud at that time, they were a bit suffering because we were pumping all the resources, because not all the persons working on the cloud will do such tests, and every day this was just for us to see how fast we can load that amount of data, and so we, we did it. You could say we were a, a noisy neighbor. Of, of course, yes. <laughs> Just a side note on the security. Um, sometimes when you do some theory, some like tests like this, uh, you disable the security just to load as fast as you can. When we did, when, when we captured our metrics, we didn't disable the security in our tool and the object storage we were using remained encrypted. Which means that this is potentially something that you can have um, in, in production and this is those could be a real production metric since we um, were respecting the security security was turned on while loading the data so we didn't remove any uh, overhead this is my my point yeah. thanks Nida. so i would like to stress the point that <clears throat> moving data at 50 gigabytes per second this is huge huge i have never seen this on premise or in a data center uh, on projects I did before. But here, it's available to everyone. It's not even using a premium storage of Azure. It's using the basic blob storage. So that's how much of a change cloud computing can bring uh, to, uh, to your workloads. And uh, thank you again, Nida, because that brings us now to step three. So all that data that we have brought into memory, now we have to put it into structures, data structures, and all those 128 nodes, we need to, to gather them in a cluster so that it's actually possible to do queries, to do interactive analysis uh, on the data. And of course, ActivePivo does that in the, in the experiment. And we've been hard at work on this topic for 10 years, so if uh, if you allow me, I'll try to summarize 10 years of R&D in two minutes. <coughs> so, the first thing that's very important for in-memory is to manage the memory the right way. It's quite obvious. And when you're running on the Java platform, it means that you have to go beyond the standard memory management of Java. In particular, you may have heard about garbage collection, this algorithm that cleans uh, objects after they are being used in Java. It has limitations that could not allow us to run on several terabytes left. So Active Pivot, in fact, also running in Java, does much of the memory management by itself, from the inside, and using what is called off-heap memory. It means memory outside of what the JVM sees, and that you can manage yourself more efficiently if you know what you're doing. And all of the important data structures of active people, the columns of numbers, because of course we are using a column store, which is the best layout for analytics. The indexes, the hash tables, uh, the simulation numbers, they are all stored off heap. They are not managed by Java. And to do that, uh, we are relying on, on very well-known operating system primitives, such as memory map. But over memory map, we have implemented a bit like our own malloc, the ActiVM malloc algorithm that works well for our workloads, that is optimized for our workloads. So you have to manage memory the right way. And of course, if you want to do something fast on those terabytes of memory, you need to use all of the processing power that you can get. And you need to use all the cores of all the processors in your cluster. And for that, there are also well-known techniques. I think we are using all of them. For instance, uh, using a special thread pool called the fork join pool. I don't know if you heard that name before. It's a special thread pool where the threads can still work from each other 
to make sure they are busy all the time and that your cores are busy all the time. It's called work stealing. And of course, we also use log free data structures everywhere we can into active PDA to avoid contentions like mutex between the threads. So we do that for our dictionaries, our queues, or, and our indexes. And in fact, if you really want to take advantage of all your processors and all your code, here is something else that uh, most in memory databases have to do. It's, uh, the idea is to partition the data in the memory. Partition the data in blocks and have one core, one of the many cores on your server, handle one partition. That way, uh, the core can operate on the partition very efficiently without uh, synchronizing or contending with the other cores. That's if you want to take advantage of all your cores. If you want to take advantage of all your memory bandwidths, you also have on bigger server to take into account NUMA, the non-uniform memory architecture. You know that servers with more than one socket, servers with multiple processors, they have the memory chips uh, a bit like distributed among the processors. And if a processor reads data from its local memory chip, the performance is optimal. But if a processor gets data from a remote chip, there is a performance penalty. And uh, you pay this a high price for in-memory workloads. So in Active Pivot, we have a, a special NUMA-aware allocation pattern that ensures that the threads running on one core always access and operate on data, on the partition of data, on the right memory chip. Very important for memory databases. Uh, on the kind of uh, hardware that we are operating in this experiment, the G5 instance, there are two processors. So it's a small amount of NUMA. NUMA impact is not very great with two processors. But if you move up to larger systems, and uh, I'm not sure it's been announced yet, but in Azure, some new bigger instances are coming called the MS series that will have up to two terabytes of memory, and those will have four processors, four sockets into the server. And in that case, the new my impact can be higher. So we have that covered. And finally, if you want to take advantage of all those servers, 128 servers in our case, you need, of course, a proper distributed architecture, something that can distribute the queries of the users and all the nodes in the best possible way. And here, the challenge is, in fact, almost the same than for NUMA. Uh, what you want is to run as much calculation as possible within the nodes uh, and sharing as little data as possible between the nodes. That's the secret of a good distributed architecture. And to do that, Active Pivot uh, uh, has a, a two a two-way architecture where we distinguish the data nodes, the 128 nodes, and the query nodes, which are just there to schedule and dispatch calculations on the nodes on the fly and reassemble partial results before sending the results to the end user. So it's only with all that that you can really uh, do something with all this data loaded in memory. And now that I've said that, I think it's time to put it on the benchmark, to put our big system on the benchmark. Here is the benchmark we've done. We have took one query doing trend analysis. Uh, trend analysis it means that it's a query that does aggregation and calculation on all the historical days in the data set. So it touches every single bit of data that we have loaded. And we've done it uh, on the raw data uh, without any optimization, query one. And we've done the same, but with enabling a special optimization in Active Hero that we call bitmap, which is a mix of uh, special indexing and some pre-aggregation. And uh, what we wanted to prove uh, with this belt pack, with those queries, was how well our system follows the Gustafsson's law. <coughs> Uh, from, the, from the Gustafsson researcher uh, who, who said once that uh, 
uh, when uh, if, if faster equipment becomes available, more servers, bigger server, then more work, uh, a bigger amount of work should be doable in the same time. That's the Gustafsson law, and it's very well. Uh, uh, it's, it's exactly what we are measuring here because what we want to see is that if we add more historical days to our workload, to a data set, is it possible to keep the same query time, the same interactivity, just by adding more nodes, adding more nodes to the cluster? That's what we want to measure. So to do that, uh, we, we started uh, by running the queries on one single node. Just one out of 100. And one node can hold about three days of historical data. So that's the first point of the uh, chart. But then we've done it with a cluster of two nodes, four nodes, eight, 16, up to the 128 full size cluster. And as you can see, the chart is pretty flat. So it means that uh, our solution. Uh, follows the Gustafsson law very well. It scales very well. And it tells a lot about um, the performance and the scalability of public cloud infrastructures, as well as of the design of Active Pivot itself as an analytic engine. And uh, if, you, if you enable the bitmap optimization in Active Pivot, you can do trend analysis on 40 terabytes of data in about five seconds. Right? That's what we mean by interactive analysis on big data. Nothing uh, other than other than that can qualify as interactive analysis on big data. So instead of looking at the query time with a flat curve, you could look at the throughput uh, curve. The throughput at which our system processes the data. This one gives you a nice ramp, a nice ramp up, a nice scale up figure. Because uh, if you think about it, these systems will uh, process data, aggregate and calculate uh, over data at almost four terabytes per second. You know those big four terabytes hard drives that you use for to store movies or PC games? So you could scan the entire thing and aggregate it in one second. That's what the cluster, this cluster is doing. It's pretty crazy. And uh, with those great results, uh, we are reaching the, the end of our presentation. And I think that we have answered our initial question, right? Can you combine the strengths of in-memory computing and of the cloud? So yes, a big yes. And uh, in fact, by combining the two, it becomes accessible to everyone. It's not just that it does work, it becomes accessible to everyone. Because for many organizations, uh, the acquisition of special large memory servers was the showstopper in the first place. Impossible to explain uh, buying so, such big servers just for one new workload. But now this barrier is gone. You can get it on the fly. You can get a server with two terabytes or, or 100 servers if you want. In 10 minutes, 10 minutes to start the servers, 13 minutes to load the data, and just a few minutes to prepare the cluster, the active people cluster. And then uh, even for organizations that could afford it, that could afford the memory computing, there were still many use cases where uh, they could not justify the cost of in-memory. This one, for instance, 40 terabytes, but uh, some, this type of analysis that you do only from time to time, only at, uh, for a specific requirement, you could not justify acquiring that many hardware just for one to do it one time. And this barrier to entry, it's gone too. It's gone too, because now you can operate it on the net. And of course, it works uh, for small problems. Uh, you could start a single instance with a few gigabytes of data, then operating in on demand, operating software such as Active Pivot on demand that would cost you maybe a few dollars per hour. But yes, it also works at scale. 
at big data scale because you can start something like that in half an hour, use it for half a day, and shut it down. Pretty worse. So that's it. That's our message today. And I would like to thank Microsoft again uh, for their partnership for making this possible. Thanks very much to our hosts. And thank you, guys, for your attention tonight and for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we will take as many questions as you want now. Uh, in the first slide, uh, there was one code which was creating the instance on Flutter. Yes. Can you know this code to that? This was uh, what we call really infrastructure as code. Yeah. 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 So the create statement, is it uh, on demand or? Yes, completely. Yes. So the query. Uh, as it requires, it can spin this. Yeah. This is a Microsoft Azure API, in fact. You can run it from your laptop, and by running this on your laptop, it will call services in the public cloud that will fire the instances and return to you when it's done. But the demand is done manual, on manual basis or an automatic basis, like uh, as your data increases yeah. on flight. So it can automatically take care of uh, creating the yes. instance. Yes. Yeah. It is very common to have automatic elasticity uh, and the size of a cluster growing and shrinking with respect to the workload. But here we did not do that. Here it was a static, uh, start it all uh, in the beginning kind of uh, configuration. Okay. What's the structure of your data? You've got 40 terabytes. Of yeah. What looks like buying the image? <laughs> yes. okay, well, this what was a detail what that's inside and yeah. manipulate yeah. what's financial, financial yeah. data, vectors, uh, arrays. Yeah. So effectively multiple, multiple structures. Yeah, but uh, structured data, structured definitely data. structured data. Uh, uh, but a lot of it, like uh, you could think of a bank having 10 million trades in the book, and each of those trades you will uh, price them in varying, in different pricing scenarios. So you may have a, a, a thousand prices just for one, one trade, you see. And all together, that gives you about 100 gigabytes per day of, uh, of financial data. And then 400 days of that. Yeah, yeah. But, but this is not, uh, this is something that, that's pretty accurate, in fact. Uh, when you look in, uh, in market risk, for instance, risk calculation or value at risk, those are this, that type of figures. So now you've got effectively a set of tables in the database. Yes. Load it up. Now you're processing. You must have some custom processing to be able to read what's the financial trade, what's the security, what's the basic yeah. data for that. Um, Absolutely, yes. Uh, Active Pivot itself keeps this knowledge when it, uh, it puts data into memory. But it keeps it in a relational format that we are all familiar with, like, like in, a, in a table. Yeah. And on the top of that, it offers, a, I would say, a, a multi-dimensional interface, like a pivot table. And we have a queue, where you yeah. pre-process it into a queue before you create the image, or you're actually getting it up there and then processing it into a queue. Yeah. Or you're just imposing your structure on it. Yeah. So you could say, I'll oh, say it's here, the, uh, Customer data that is over here. Yeah, well, you, you, you're touching on an important topic. Yeah. So, in the case of Active Pivot, we keep the the incoming structure. We keep it as it was uh, as an input. Yeah. And then yeah. just follow the rules of that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So no cleaning, no scrubbing of data. Okay. No, no, and it's very important because it, it allows us mm -hmm. to load the data in the memory in the right way, uh, like in streaming. Uh, while the data is loading, you know, from blob storage to the instances, at the same time, in fact, like, like in a streaming process, Active Pivot is preparing its, its internal data structure. And that's why at the end of the 13 minutes of loading, in fact, Active Pivot is already ready because it's done all the work at the same time that the data was loaded. Uh, <coughs> Would you give away the 
We, we, we were told to give away a nice mm -hmm. Windows 10 pen. Yes. I will answer the question and you will distribute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I have a curious What was the company role? You see, like the platform or service provider. Because uh, this is kind of huge, uh, yeah. compute instance, uh, it's like a cost of law. Then you just uh, mentioned banks. Uh, in fact, in Singapore, domestic banks, uh, risk management majority is a uh, French product, Murex. Yeah. 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 Well, first, we were trying to set a record here. I'm, I'm not saying all of our customers are operating uh, at this scale. We were just trying to send a message. Uh, yeah. um, actual, actual applications running uh, in investment banks, mm -hmm. some of them in Singapore, mm -hmm. Standard Chartered, IZ, they are using active people, for instance. It's more in, in even below a terabyte or a few terabytes. Mm -hmm. Us as a company, uh, we are like uh, we are technology maker, of course. So we write the digital technology. We we do not uh, operate it uh, at this scale as a, as a service, not yet. But maybe many people are asking because uh, it's very appealing to to be able to do uh, interactive analytics at this scale. And you said it would be very expensive. So how much do you think this cluster costs uh, per hour? To like like ballpark figure, how much you think it is? <laughs> Unless you have a special big price. No 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 list price list yeah. price yeah. list price is one thousand dollars per hour. Real life probably half that. But normally, how long the duration to come on the report was expected? Hmm. Well, you've seen you've seen we've done the full trend analysis queries on the data set in uh, five seconds. So if, if you had a thousand reports to, to run, you could do them within an hour. In this. But it's not necessarily how our technology is used most often. It's more for interactive analysis, right? Okay. Giving it to the end users. Yeah, this data set is static, yeah. yes. So you can yeah. run loads of different queries depending on which instance. Yes. So if you have 30 uh, Absolutely. running, you could run 30 different queries. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, by queries, don't just think. Uh, right. Yeah. By queries, don't just think about uh, a sum or an average. Remember, we have an engine that can do actual calculations, like uh, cross currency, uh, quantile, statistics, everything you need for evaluatories, for instance, all on the fly, like it was a simple sum. Yeah. Um, your hardware picture that you showed. Uh, you have a CPU and a core, uh, the core and the memory. Yeah. So in that, uh, oh yeah, this one. This one? The pre yeah. So there's a relationship between the, the core and the memory. Yes. Right? Yeah. So you bring the data, aggregate it, and then do the computation. But there is a master slave relationship between the mm -hmm. slaves and uh, distributing to the slaves and getting it through. Yes, you, you, you could call it master slave, right? but it, it's. Um we use a master a master slave technology for um, for the distributed architecture, like between the servers. But within one server, you must be using more partitioning. Yeah. yeah. This piece of the information is on this system. This yeah. Is on this yeah. System. This is, this piece. Yes, of course. Yeah. In in this case, historical days, in fact, are the partitioning key. His, historical days. Every box has several dates. Yeah. Several days. That's a very easy one. Yeah. Oh. But but so for, for within one box, uh, how do we dispatch uh, work on the on the processors? We, we use a special thread pool of our own, like a one big thread pool that gets tasked and that itself spreads it among the four threads thread pools that we have. We have one thread pool for each for each processor. In fact. Yeah. It's really the internals that uh, you asked for it. <laughs> and you your instance fails. Let's say the uh, end of the instance fails when it is doing the computation. How will this be done? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the last. Or doing something, the instance fails, the Azure instance. The, yeah. One VM fails, and then what happens to the rest? Because oh. you have distributed yeah. data. One uh, instance is carrying certain data, yeah. and in within the pipeline of vectors, you need that. Yeah. It's very important because it's not replicated anymore. Of course, yes. Yeah. So, so well, how do you manage that? So we did, we did that, I'm going to take this one. You identify which sections have failed and then we try to do it. Yeah, we don't do that. Actually, the, within the cluster, there is no failover, but we did 
uh, in the past. Some tests with um, you know products like a Chef or Puppet, where you decide to if there is this instance. I mean, you write your recipe, right? You say if this instance fails, so start another instance and load the same data that was in the in the previous instance. So that here we're talking about um, it's a problem of uh, of failover. But th this, of course, the whole cluster we were not expecting any not to fail when we were running such test. But if you want, like our clients today, what they do is they have one primary site and then one disaster recovery site and then if there is something that fails at the primary they switch the clients to the disaster recovery site as simple as that yeah what yeah, yeah. okay uh, i noticed that uh, you guys have implemented using java on, on yeah. the site uh, have you guys also considered uh, using other languages that are supported and other functions so that you can track because they have in the cloud uh, I, I, sorry, I'm sorry, I missed the second part. Uh, we uh, considering other languages. Um, ah, uh, for like the Azure functions. Azure functions. Part is that, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Java is supported. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we use. Uh, thank you. We we use Java for uh, our core technology, like uh, our database. But for instance, when it comes to the UI, we use JavaScript. I wanted to mention that, but uh, now to we we haven't we haven't found a use case yet where we could uh, from inside a calculation from one of our calculations we could leverage lambda. We haven't found a, a use case for that yet. But that being said, we are using lambda for other parts of the software. For instance, uh, for the licensing, we have a special uh, pay-as-you-go licensing when you operate active people in the cloud. And the way it works is that every time you start an active pivot uh, somewhere in the cloud, it calls a Lambda function that will record the usage in the database. So we, we do benefit from the, all the services and the ecosystem of the cloud. But within our engine itself, it's, it's, it's pure Java and, uh, and uh, for best performance. It's usually the Azure API, so you could actually manage users via PowerShell to effectively duplicate the same. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. You just be calling the same yeah. API call. For starting, yes. For the C sharp program. Of course. Or COBOL or whatever. All right. So, yeah, starting it. Uh, one one last question. Sure, as could be done. Uh, I have, I have the lady over there is like raising. <laughs> distributed. <laughs> <laughs> when we are out of paint, I also have name cards. Is it, is it supposed to be part of the. Excuse me? Pizza. I've, I've been told pizza are here, so we can we can keep talking over there uh, yeah. unless you have. A pizza is already there. If uh, you want to have it, then you can. Just have so a pizza. Couple more, couple more, maybe just <laughs> <laughs> couple more. Just one question. Okay. The ladies first. Yeah, sure. I'm French, I have to uh, operate on the French. <laughs> Since you uh, don't have any idea of the uh, benchmark, how your solution can be, can be compared with Apache Spark, with like the common metric of performance and price? Whew, that's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> but I can do a, at least a, 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 a comparison on, on, on feature, for instance. For a, a database like SAP ANA. It's really a SQL database that runs faster. But it's still doing SQL. So you, you have the building blocks of a SQL database, so uh, um, group by, sum, average, we want to do that. While Active Pivot has, has a true calculation engine when you can put your business logic and calculate an SLA, a price, or a financial reason, for instance. And then Apache Spark uh, is, is, uh, is more like us when it comes to the flexibility of uh, the calculation you can, you can do, but it's more batch processing. It's more of one batch, taking a data set, processing it, and writing the results somewhere else. And it's not something 100 users could run at the same time. You, know, you, could, have, you could not have 100 users launching 100 Apache Spark batches on the fly. Uh, when, you do, when you use Spark in general, you do one transformation batch, and then you give the output to end users who will use standard BI. 
So very quickly, that, that's how I would draw the line between the, the system. And, uh, and then as operating active pivot is probably cheaper, not just because of license cost, but because of the agility and the flexibility with which you can deploy it. So you, you cannot do uh, SAP ANA uh, in, the, in this way. You, SAP, SAP ANA requires certified uh, big, uh, big scale up hardware and, and nothing else, while active pivot runs on a laptop. Or on a cluster or a big iron. I have a question. How do you want to take your data? Do you want to take Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, if you're doing financial say, it's yeah. changing yeah. day by day, second by second. Oh, yes. So this is a. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it turned into a, an ActiVM product description, but yeah, it, it is one of our big strengths. Well, but opposite to traditional OLAP solution, where you have to build the cube and then it's read only, we are completely incremental. We can keep loading data and at the same time operating queries on it with a, an MVCC concurrency model. And, it's, uh, and the reason for that was that our primary market was a uh, financial market where everything flows, trades, prices. And so uh, it's, it's one of the big feature of the platform that you can <coughs> build your cubes incrementally uh, with, uh, with data. Yeah. Okay. You send the data and age out the old stuff, so you could then right. 30 day of the For instance. 90 day analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Last one. Last call. Could you please show us the diagram when you have multiple storage accounts, multiple streams, multiple servers? The, the final uh, data loading slide. This one, right? No, uh, uh, technical. Uh, no. No. Uh, which one? Which one? This, yeah. this one, no? Okay. So you yeah. data, which is 14 terabyte, is it divided into smaller chunks and distributed into 40 storage accounts, or it is copied in 40 times into 40 storage accounts? No, no, no. It, it is distributed. There is no distributed uh, across the yes. Let's say one terabyte per storage account. Not Roughly, yeah. Terabyte. This is this is yeah exactly. Yeah. So which means when you spin up these clusters. These servers, right? You have to have some kind of mapping to read from the different storage accounts. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's right. And in your Java SDK. Yeah, yeah. How do you define that mapping? What? Well, in this case, it's very simple. Yeah. Each server has three historical days to load, so you just have to distribute uh, those days to the servers at, at startup time. In this case is very easy because the data is naturally partitioned. Per historical day, yeah. Yeah. Uh, some other workloads are more difficult to, to partition. Uh, you have to look at other business fields, maybe the booking, maybe the region. Uh, but here, it, it's very natural. You, you just add dispatch like a round robin the historical days to the servers. So the file names are called per day, date, and yeah, the name of the file uh, has, uh, has the date in it. Some simple pattern like that. No, nothing fancy. Uh, on that. I ask you later. Okay. Sure. So, Pizza, now? Uh, yeah, one one last question. One last question. Okay, so Do you have any critical question to ask? <laughs> uh, the one who answered will get the jacket. <laughs> so, uh, I'm asking the question? Yes. <laughs> Some critical question, man. How, how many nodes? What's the total number of nodes? You raise your hand, please. <laughs> One critical question. So you just raise the hand, don't answer the question. Uh, just tell me the full name of these two speakers. <laughs> French guy, French guy. <laughs> okay, you? Please, Bowser. Yeah, me, Nida is good. Uh, and Tony, Tony is fine, Tony is fine. Uh, Say first. <laughs> okay. Fine? Okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you guys. Meet you around the pizza. Cheers.